so, so excited to be here in Stockholm. I've wanted to visit for such a long time, and to be so close to where all of this started is uh, very exciting. Um, uh, and to be back in person again has been so nice to actually see people in more than, uh, more than just in a flat screen. Uh, and thanks for staying to the very end. Uh, I know these conference days can end up being quite long, um, but uh, you, know, you have me for about another hour or so here. So, uh, I'm going to be talking about burning our laurels, network evolution, the consistency treadmill, and transcending space-time. So that was pretty dramatic. Let's start with something maybe less dramatic. Uh, in 827, Abu Hafs, uh, having conquered Alexandria and then being ejected from Alexandria, uh, took his 12,000 followers uh, to find a new home, and they decided that they were going to go and uh, fight the literal Byzantine generals on Crete. And uh, so they got in their boats, they rode over, so it was about 3,000 soldiers and their families. And uh, when they got there, uh, he ordered for the uh, possibly apocryphal, but uh, first time in, in uh, recorded history, them to burn their boats. Uh, other than this being the first recorded network partition in the Mediterranean since the Odyssey, uh, this was, as you can imagine, very motivating for them. There was no way back. This was the point of no return. They uh, conquered Crete and established the first emirate of Crete. We're not going to be burning anything today, um, but sometimes it's important for us to think about the things that we hold so dear, and that uh, we've been looking uh, at the world as, and try to adopt their opposite as a way of uh, moving forward and finding new ways of doing things when maybe the world around us has changed. Uh, my name is Brooklyn Zelenka. You can find me anywhere on the internet as Xpeed. I'm the CTO at Fission. Um, it's actually uh, also where Quinn, this morning's keynote, uh, works. When we were asked to give these keynotes, we didn't work together yet, but now we do, so you're getting a lot of vision today. Um, and we're working on uh, not everything that I'm going to talk about here today, uh, but there's uh, actually a fair bit of overlap. We sometimes call ourselves post-serverless computing uh, or local first. My background is in programming language theory, virtual machines, and distributed systems. And in this community, I'm known for being the author of Witchcraft, which brings a lot of ideas from Haskell into Elixir, uh, Algae, which is a library for doing algebraic data types, and Exceptional, a ergonomic uh, error handling library that gives you essentially uh, with or maybe, but in a pipeable manner. Uh, I also do a lot of standards, like the user-controlled authorization networks. I'm the editor of that uh, specification. Uh, I used to do uh, standards for Ethereum, uh, now Filecoin, multi-formats, and a few others. And uh, run a few meetups, including the Distributed Systems Reading Group. If you're into distributed systems, the next one, they're monthly, uh, is on Tuesday. So sign up uh, and come uh, read about the COM theorem. I also have stickers. If you're not here in person, if you're calling from uh, uh, watching online, uh, drop us a line at Fission Codes, and uh, we'll mail you some. Uh, otherwise, myself or Quinn, we have them uh, here in person. And uh, I gave another keynote about two weeks ago in Salt Lake City, uh, where I talked about a lot of the same ideas, but up at the language layer. Um, and how we can push things forward there. Uh, so taken together, you can think of these as the let's change everything, K thinks by uh, talks. Um, so if you're watching this afterwards, uh, they pair well together, but you don't need to have seen uh, the other. So we're here because we love the beam. And the beam made a lot of really great decisions right from the beginning, right, right from the get-go. And in a lot of ways, for the past 35, 36 years, we've actually been ahead of the industry, right? Everybody else is copying us. These ideas are spreading into other places, and that's exactly what we want, right? We like this way of working. We want it to end up in ACA and Orleans, right, and in, in other places. But it does mean that these ideas are less unique to us. And for the first time in about three decades, the actual underlying network infrastructure is changing. There's some new things for us to think about. So today, I'm going to ask some uncomfortable questions in an attempt to find some new directions for us to grow. Uh, you can save the rotten fruit for the end. When we think about uh, 
ecosystems and design in general. Um, you can think of it as being almost like gradient descent. So you're in this, this space, and there are high points and low points, and better designs and worse designs. And uh, if you're on one of these hills, uh, you don't know which one you're on. You might be actually uh, be on this one. We're definitely not in a valley, because literally any way we go, things would be better. So we're actually definitely on top, not in the bottom here. And things are pretty good. But uh, there's definitely higher peaks, right? In the year 3000, we will not be writing software that we write it today. We will be doing things differently. And we need to find those other peaks, which sometimes means going down a little bit and exploring around and seeing if we can find it more higher slopes so we can get to the top. The good news is that we can go and ask some other uh, adventurous people what they've been looking at and what they've been doing. We don't know how close these two are together, right? We have to still go find them, but uh, we can get sources from many different places. We need to have an absolute Cambrian explosion of approaches. Some of them will yield fruit, others will go nowhere, and that's okay. Others still will be amazing, and sometimes we'll discover things that we never thought were possible. We need to go exploring, right? Every now and then, we need to say, has the world, has our context meaningfully changed? What are the resulting trade-offs of that changing environment around us? And is anything holding us back? We need to take a right turn into adventure. The Haskell community has a saying, avoid success at all costs. But this has uh, two, two ways, two emphases, right? Two meanings. We can say that we're avoiding success at all costs, or that we should avoid pursuing success at the, the cost of everything else. So while keeping the things that we like, how can we keep moving forward? We're not saying let's throw out everything and start fresh, right? Let's keep things um, uh, building on this solid foundation. That said, let's think if processes are actually that central to what we do. So the context of how we got here uh, is obviously um, based on when things were developed, right? Actors are a fabulous fit for the internet and for cloud computing. I think we all have some, some understanding of why, right? Uh, the internet is it's literally in the name, inter-network. Uh, and uh, Erlang was designed specifically to do networking, right? Uh, uh, telephone applications. And really, at the beginning, and nothing else. Which turns out to be a really nice way of working as soon as you have lots of different machines. The other half of why this worked so well, because there's lots of people trying to do this, um, is when you want to have a consistent interface across near and, and uh, far uh, machines and memory, you can go uh, either to try to make everything feel local or uh, everything feel remote. When everything feels local, that makes a lot of sense, right? Uh, we have objects, we've got encapsulation, we're going to try to make everything and hide the network, right? And keep everything feel like it's right here. When that works, it's fabulous, right? We have hidden automatic interfaces, magic happens in the background, and there's networking. But networked applications are different. They can fail. They can be not available. They can go down. Messages can be lost. And so this is a leaky abstraction. And what you end up doing is exposing all of these extra knobs and special cases and extra fields uh, so that uh, we can even work this way at all. As so we go from this nice high-level thing and then down. The other way, which Erlang took, is to make things that are nearby feel far. This is very, very powerful. It gives you a ton of control, makes things concurrent by default. On a trade-off, it can have some boilerplate. But you can actually work around that. That's a tractable problem, because now you can add abstraction. Right? You don't always have to write gen, gen servers directly. You can also use uh, agents and other, uh, uh, other abstractions. I like to say that 1994 is when uh, the internet really got started. The W3C uh, was founded. Netscape was launched. 
uh, which has now become Firefox. Uh, and you could take your Nokia 2110 and use it as a modem for your laptop. So we were literally doing mobile computing in the mid-90s. The picture back then was that uh, you had a desktop computer. It was a beige box. It sat on your desk. You weren't going to lug it around. It was relatively slow, but you still needed to access, you know, maybe you're going to uh, the office and you want to access some files there or uh, share photos with somebody. So we need to put those somewhere else. We need to push those across the wire and put a process in front of it that knows how to serve those to us and connect to it over the internet. And this works pretty well. Um, because that's its idle most of the time, we figure, oh, well, you know, let's do some time share with this. Let's, let's actually hold lots of different people's things, which means we need to, uh, now we're in a multi-tenant situation, so we need to access control this. Over time, people use the internet more and more, uh, and our service gets really, really popular. Uh, so we put it behind a load balancer and replicate it out and are doing all this complex uh, coordination of data and the database and the access control lists and all of that logic between these different systems. Uh, and that is a lot, of, uh, a lot of complexity to deal with directly. So we put it behind a uh, abstraction called the cloud. But unfortunately, we're still dealing with a lot of servers, and we still have to think about too much. So we decided uh, to actually add uh, more servers, but call it serverless, and you know, kind of push these things away from us even more. So we have, yet again, another leaky abstraction. Right? The single source of truth is the database, in scare quotes. It's very server-centric. We have to train people to do full-stack development, right? front end, back end. DevOps, Kubernetes, Docker, all of these things. Uh, the idea, really, is that we can take this LAMP-style architecture, right, Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP, uh, and replace parts of it so that we can have, say, a, a Phoenix server. And we want to keep repackaging that in a way that we can ship it around and abstract it away from ourselves. But again, this is very leaky. In order to provide the, the, those abstractions, we've needed to rely on AWS, Azure, and GCP. Right? And there's nothing fundamentally wrong about that. It's just it becomes very difficult uh, to, to have any real uh, other choice. So how do we fix this? We need to get out of this painted corner. This is uh, a simplification of a wordly map. It's an idea from uh, innovation theory. Essentially, on the y-axis, we have how visible something is, and on the x-axis, how mature a technology is, all the way from the first moment it's thought of all the way to it being a complete utility. And so things tend to be quite uh, visible and then become uh, disappear over time. So uh, TCP IP was very visible right, in, in the early 90s. And now, we expect every networking stack to come with it. We don't even really think about it. Right? We, in fact, have abstractions on top of it that we don't even think about. Electricity, you, you know, originally, you'd have to hang you know, wires. Things would catch on fire. It was very scary. And now you hit a light switch, and you just expect it to be there. And what this enables, then, uh, oh, sorry. We tend to play from custom to off the shelf, right? in this middle section, most companies. And that makes sense. Right? Because we have this uh, value curve in the middle here. And when you get all the way out to utility, it's mainly about making things very, very efficient and lowering your cost so that uh, you can uh, be profitable at scale. The advantage of this is that once something's become a battle-tested, mature utility, that opens up the next cycle of innovation. And we can start building things on top of that. So we never get rid of TCP IP or electricity, but we can now build the next generation of things on top of it. Distributed systems, I mean, very broadly speaking, uh, has been a progression of thinking about uh, these things. So we started with literal physical resource management. How am I going to write to the same piece of memory? Through immaterial objects, which is just data, files, right? These are things that are abstract. They don't have to live on this disk at you know, this many radians and on this you know, ring. Literally, files as, as we think of them today, distributed state machines, failure, at asynchrony, adversarial computing. And finally, essentially what we're coming today is uh, thinking a lot about scalability. And we spend most of our time thinking about immaterial objects, and in this community, a bit about things like failure and asynchrony, mostly because 
the underlying VM handles this for us, and the basic models and libraries, OTP, handles this for us. When we take a step back and we look at the history of distributed systems, uh, all the way back in the 60s with Mutex and semaphores uh, through to you know, the, the really cool stuff today, like CRDTs and SNARKs and Twizzler, um, we see that it's actually not that long of a history. Right? It's 20, uh, uh, 60, 70 years. Right? Um, and Erlang starts about halfway through and actually comes just after uh, FLP impossibility. Right? This is a, a fundamental idea in distributed systems. Right? It says that there's no possible way to build a totally general asynchronous system. You have to use, make some assumptions and have some subsets um, and have different kind of overlapping systems. Erlang was released before things like transactional memory, uh, practical Byzantine fault tolerance, and of course, uh, the notorious Nakamoto consensus, which runs blockchains. The fundamental shift that we're experiencing is one in locality and different ways of thinking about locality. As we bring on more services, more IoT, more uh, self-driving cars, and uh, augmented reality, we are going to be pushing, and we already are, pushing huge volumes of data over the wire. And not just the amount, but the rate. The rate of change has really increased. Right? You have all of these sensors, and they're pushing data um, to all of these data centers. And you know, on, on the face of it, that's actually not, not really a problem. Um, except when you look at how many data centers we have. So I'm going to pick on AWS here. Um, they have uh, these data centers. Uh, they're you know, uh, distributed uh, a, a little bit unevenly, like there's none, none here or here, which is fine because people don't really live there. No, nope, people totally live there. Whoops. Right? Uh, and you can really see where the, uh, the heaviest usage is. Right? So there's none. In, uh, in this little circle up here, which has 50 million people in it, right? they have to connect to these ones that are around them. By comparison, in North America, you have 56 million people per data center dedicated to each, each of those 50 or so million people. In South America, it's 435 million. And in Africa, it's 1.4 billion people. And if you think people in Africa aren't using the internet, bad, bad news, maybe good news, actually, and they're only using it more. There's also places uh, that are islands that don't have a direct connection to a data center. So they have an un underwater cable, or as now we're getting things like Starlink, we can go up into, literally into space to satellites and then bring it back down. Sending a direct message in this model is not super direct. So here I'm sending a uh, you know, text message from Madrid to Valencia. And of course, I take the very direct method of going to Paris first and then all the way back, which is, uh, we'll just round down and call it seven times the time, energy, carbon, maintenance, and literal physical hardware required. Bandwidth used to be uh, the thing that uh, we really had to get things, um, uh, that was the, the blocker to developing. Our, the maximum physical limit for bandwidth, we're not even close to hitting. When you uh, get a certain amount of information in a, you know, the maximum amount of information in a volume of space, you get a black hole. So we're not anywhere near that yet. But we are hitting the limits on the speed of light, which is the speed of causality. Uh, this uh, 2017 image from uh, Ericsson shows a lot of these newer use cases that need to be very, very fast, right? 10 milliseconds all the way up to maybe a couple hundred milliseconds with very, very f uh, low failure rates for things that we really want, like smart grid, factory automation, and uh, autonomous vehicles. And the reason that that number curves up is that uh, as we have a higher failure rate, or, or rather, uh, need to have a higher degree of reliability, we may need to send more messages back and forth. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we can tolerate a little bit more um, uh, time by doing more, uh, more requests at an edge database. Because, 
uh, we need uh, to respect the speed of light. Uh, it's estimated that by 2025, two thirds of the data uh, will be generated outside of on-prem or a cloud. This is in edge data centers, directly on device. Uh, so Tesla does actually a lot of machine learning right in the car, right? They have computers uh, uh, embedded right into it, and they're doing a lot of the machine learning right there for uh, self-driving self -driving car data. And uh, Uber, when you uh, hail a car, they actually uh, do most of that directly on the, dr the driver and, uh, and rider's phones directly. Uh, so this is uh, growing. This is uh, a thing that actually, surprisingly, I've talked to a few people at the conference here, and they're already trying to, to do a lot of these techniques. So our environment is changing. When we designed the way things currently work, the internet was convenient. Now it's absolutely critical. Things used to live in a data center. Now they live right on your client. They used to be stuck under your desk. Now they travel around with you. Our bottleneck was bandwidth, now it's latency. And the market used to be the US and EU, and now it's global, and literally the moon. We're putting a, uh, a telecommunications network on the moon in the next couple of years. Uh, so that's quite a lot of latency between the moon and Earth, as you can imagine. So we have a new topology showing up. It starts with the device in your pocket, or wherever you are. It goes out to the cell tower, which has a little bit of storage and compute right on it, you know, a few blocks away from you. That can sometimes go up to a uh, uh, satellite network, something like Starlink. There's edge networks, uh, data centers that are some, uh, you know, uh, double digit kilometers away from you, which have a little bit more power, a little bit more storage, and then the traditional cloud, uh, which has quite a lot of storage and quite a lot of power. This is starting to become local first, or be called local first. Uh, the cell tower is where we do very, very real time things. So if you're texting somebody uh, near you. Uh, edge for uh, relay replication consistency, you know, pushing things that are more geographically uh, relevant. And then finally, for training data, aggregation, batching, et cetera, uh, in the cloud. So there's this evolving toolbox, right? And with this new, very heterogeneous picture with different capabilities all over the place, including things that are not even owned by anyone, so that anything in a, a commons network, like network data or blockchains, um, that are run totally globally, radically shifts how we think about auth, locality, ownership, and reliability. The first thing to remember is that it turns out that consistency is a lie. The limitation that data has to live in one particular place is the fundamental fact of distributed systems, right? It's an extremely powerful limitation that we don't have access to everything all the time directly. Uh, there's a few problems with uh, the CAP theorem. Uh, I, I'm not a huge fan of it, so we're actually going to talk about PACALC instead. Um, it says that if you have, uh, you have two choices under two uh, conditions. If you're in a network partition, so there's two computers that can't talk to each other, you have to pick between availability and consistency. To not choose availability means that your system is just down. So you can always, yeah, you can turn your machine off, um, but that's not usually the one that people will pick, so we're gonna go with availability here. Otherwise, when you're running normally, you gotta pick between latency and consistency. And there's absolutely use cases where you want consistency instead, right? So we have a normally running system, and maybe you only need to check things in you know, once a minute. And we're all going to say, if a machine doesn't check things in, we're going to pretend that it's down. Uh, otherwise, we want latency. And this is the, the bulk of, um, of use cases. We want uh, things to be, feel very, very snappy. So this is what we're going to be talking about today is a PAEL system. Because the speed of light is limited, we can only communicate so fast. One way of thinking about this is as a light cone. So as you move up through this cone, uh, we can interact with more possible things over time. Hence, the cone gets larger. And it creates these. You can think of it almost like a ripple on the map 
of how fast, how far that message can be sent. So if we scale through this, we can see that they, over time, uh, uh, do hit each other and they do overlap. So if you're thinking about, oh, well, you know, hey, look, this overlaps here, maybe, maybe that's sufficient, right? Maybe uh, I can just make my latency enough that I get this, this overlapped portion. Okay, sure. Uh, when you have two observers and they're separated in space, their light cones don't uh, match perfectly. They can be rotated or shifted a little bit. And you're working now in this, just this little triangle instead. So we're always stuck in this version of uh, events where we're seeing things come in different orders from each other uh, or uh, with very different uh, timing between them. And the upshot of this is that it causes causal subjectivity, where there's no independent, you know, unified way of saying this is the order in which things happened. It's I saw them in, in this order. And this isn't something about distributed systems. This is something about the fabric of reality itself. This is physics. There's an idea that's uh, spreading quite a lot in distributed systems right now that says for us to uh, move forward in, uh, in these systems, we need to give up on this idea that there's a single system image, that there is the single source of truth, that there is the database. It's impractical to look for one or a small number of these systems um, and to have them be totally consistent all the time. To expect a single system image uh, depends that you, uh, forces you to depend on place and time. So let's look at uh, place-oriented programming, or PLOP, uh, a bit. And I was delighted to see when, when I got here uh, that you, in fact, have a chocolate bar named after this principle. Um, as data becomes increasingly distributed, right, uh, we depend more and more on RPC. And this limits performance, makes our systems rigid, and makes them less expressive. It makes it hard to work with. That's fine, because we have actors, um, which gives us you know, the, the ability to reason about small pieces in aggregate. Right? So we, we have all these little pieces, all these little actors, and they send messages to each other. This is sometimes described as being an organism, and uh, you know, where we can build up a larger system out of these, these small pieces. But especially in a large network, where we have lots of different um, parts coming together, well, even organisms can be co quite complex. Every step here in uh, breaking down sugar is simple, but taking an aggregate, that's a lot that's going on. There's some degree of irreducible complexity Right? So we can lock things down and say, well, I wrote it this way, and it's only going to work this way. But if we want to have a flexibility in our system, then uh, our actors need to be able to talk to each other uh, sort of more dynamically. Right? So here's three actors. They have their message queues. And I want these two to talk to each other. And we need to have some consistent data between them. So maybe we're doing a bank transfer. So they need to lock uh, their states and uh, not accept messages from anybody else. And one of them then crashes, and we end up in an inconsistent state. So now we need to take the other actor down and uh, restart this whole subsystem, which can then potentially cascade out. There are coordination costs when things like this happen. Uh, so when you have embarrassing, embarrassingly parallel problems, you can get really close to this ideal line, where you add more parallelization, and you just get more throughput. A lot of problems, most problems, uh, either fall into what's known as Amdahl's law, or more importantly, into the universal scaling law, which says that when you have incoherence, data contention, these inconsistent states, uh, when you add a lot of parallelization, you actually lose throughput. We can also end up in a state where we understand this subsystem because right? we've deployed it, this is our code, and it works to a spec, and we can treat it like a black box. Right? It's, a, it's a state machine. Even though there's all these pieces underneath, we can really say like the semantics of this is, is this fixed thing. As soon as we connect that to another, uh, it changes the meaning. Uh, so we know that uh, specifications don't compose, and if we want to be able to be very, very um, uh, open and interoperable, this is a real challenge. Uh, the other thing that can happen is when you don't have uh, sandboxing 
is, uh, is pretty easy to write uh, little viruses once you get past, say, a firewall. So here's uh, the you know, charmingly named virus, virus loop, and infest, uh, which uh, essentially can now take over and spread its code to uh, other agents and other actors. So even for the same reason as on the, same, the previous slide, that uh, we receive messages and uh, now our specs don't compose, well, somebody can take advantage of that and say, I'm going to change the meaning of this subsystem to something that's uh, how I want it to run, because it's going to accept my messages. When we have um, these very large systems, sometimes adding more uh, um, capacity and more asynchrony can have paradoxical consequences. Right? We've seen a few widespread outages. Late last year, uh, Roblox went down for 73 hours. Um, the Verge uh, insists that it was not because of Chipotle. This is their network graph. Uh, and you'd assume that this part is the problem. But it's actually this part's the problem. Basically, uh, they knew that they were going to have a spike in, uh, in, in use, so they did two things. They switched a synchronous system to an asynchronous one, to streaming, and they increased the number of nodes by 50%. So you'd think that they would be all good now. But it caused uh, uh, message amplification, and it took down their entire system. It took them over three days to find the problem and then roll it back to the previous uh, network state. This is uh, starting to be called a metastable failure. And we're seeing it in mainly in large companies today. So Facebook, Roblox, and similar. Uh, there's actually a really nice paper from Facebook on metastable failures in distributed systems. Uh, that's their graph uh, up in the top. But uh, here's a, a physical metaphor that they're actually referencing in the name metastable. So if you have some uh, chemical process and you're trying to uh, speed up reaction or, or even create the reaction, sometimes you have to say add heat. You need to add energy to the system. So it's the same basic idea here. We are in a stable state. We start adding load to the system. It goes up. We're now in a dangerous state. But then the load goes down, and everything's fine. And then eventually, we go up, we hit this tipping point, and we fall back down into this lower energy state. And now we're stuck down here. Right? We want to get out of this failing system where we have this you know, heavy amount of system thrash, where nobody can connect to us, but we don't have enough energy to get up and out of that valley. This can be caused by things like retries, causing work amplification, or just general thrash in the system. So places are a way for us to organize concurrency and interoperation. They're not necessarily the way. So let's talk about finding ways of getting massive reliability with maybe another way of looking at the problem. Uh, Heraclitus said, you can never step into the same process twice. Because while values themselves are eternal, when you have the words, hello world, that's the same string, hello world, on my machine or your machine. It doesn't matter. They're modular. They're universal. We can pass them around. They're pure, and they can be compared by equality. Processes, specifically, run over time and in space. They're inseparable from that. You can't abstract this out. They're unique, and they have their own identity because they're separated by some space. Actors co-locate mutable references with processes. So we have values, we have references, some sort of mutable register, and then actors that can uh, talk to each other. They have specific interfaces. And when, you, you, when you're fully distributed, they expose only a certain interface, which means that you can't always get in and get all of the data that you want. Right? And there's obviously problems with getting full reign and full access that we now have new techniques for addressing. Here's some piece of data. It has a fair bit of reliability on that service. And then we've replicated it geographically on totally independent services. And across a network, here's an actor requesting that data. And it can request from multiple, right, Re redundantly. Here's another set of actors. 
and they can also access it redundantly. And the, the key thing to note here is that this isn't uh, some web server that you're saying, hey, please give me this you know, file at this path. We're saying, well, if we have a universal identifier, we can replicate this infinitely, put it literally anywhere on any machine, and have uh, a higher degree of reliability. Because when you start sticking even these relatively low availability systems together, we can get a high number of nines very quickly. We just need that redundancy. What's changed about this from 30 years ago? Well, now we have a huge amount of disk space, geographically distributed, always accessible by the network. Right? Why not get 11 nines, 12 nines, 15 nines? We can also package up code, freeze it, and use code as data so that we can then copy a process, put it as data, and now anybody can fetch that code and anyone can run that code. Parallelizing uh, execution can also be done in this model. So if we take a look at, here's a bunch of function calls, and we can run either bar or baz first. It doesn't matter. So pictorially, that looks like this, where we have bar and baz as blue and yellow on the side. If we run one after the other, or them concurrently, or in true parallel, it doesn't matter. right? These are all valid expressions. Same thing if we have a little bit more of a complex picture. So in this one, uh, we can run the blue node, or the, the blue function, uh, anywhere in any of these orders, as long as uh, orange comes before purple and blue stays within this, uh, between the red and green nodes. If we take that up to general practical programming, we can analyze these ahead of time, grab data, literally fetch an entire you know, subset uh, of the data that we need to work on, and now just uh, do pure transformations on data. If I run that, you run that, anybody runs that, we get the same result back. We can cache the result of this. We can write that back into storage that anyone can access. They never have to run this again. We have a couple uh, data structures that help with this. You may have heard of some of them. One way of thinking about this is it's almost like having a PID, but for data, for something that's static and doesn't move. So here's a data structure. It's a tree. And every node in it gets its own hash. We call this a Merkle tree. You can find, uh, you can prove that some data is in here by giving the path inside of it and the top hash. We can show that this is owned by somebody by writing in ownership just directly as data inside. That changes that hash as well. And importantly, because we want to hide things, we don't want the entire internet to be able to read absolutely everything. If I need to prove my ID is inside of some larger structure, I can give uh, something called a cryptographic accumulator, just this one path without showing anything else about what's stored in there. You don't even know how many items are inside. So trustless modularity. If we want to build services that talk to each other directly um, without pre-negotiation, without needing to look at an API ahead of time. Uh, Joe once uh, dreamed that you could have Erlang systems where every process could talk to every other process worldwide. Well, what if we had all applications talk to all other applications worldwide without needing to uh, look at the manual ahead of time? What happens when everything is reachable by everything else by default? Well, we need to start doing especially access control pretty differently. So here's the picture that most people see. It's called access control lists, or ACLs. We have an actor, we have a process, and when we send a message, we're stopped. The guard process checks, are you on the list? And then, yep, you're on the list. Okay, great, we're going to forward that on. And this you know, really cleanly breaks into three stages, which is nice, uh, but it does mean that these are not in control, right? It's this one process in control. We're back in this place-oriented view of the world. And we need to keep this list up to date, right? We have to replicate this around, and that can take time, and that can be inconsistent over time. The other model uh, is called uh, capabilities. And it actually looks a lot like the actor model. So here's our actor that can send messages to a mailbox. Here's an agent. It's going to send messages to another collaborative 
agent. And it has everything that it needs uh, to complete this request directly in that message, right? J just like how we send messages uh, in Erlang. We can make copies of them. We can make subsets. We can transform them. We can delegate them to someone else. So in this case, we're saying, hey, here's how to find this other process. And now we can send it messages. And in this credentialed world, we can make a copy of that ticket. And now that's available everywhere. When Chris McCord was uh, building, or had, had built, I guess, uh, Phoenix Presence, uh, he reached for CRDTs. These are mergeable data structures. They don't care what order they came in at, uh, if they were delayed, anything like that. You get the same messages, you see the same things. This means that you have no single point of failure, no single source of truth, and self-heal. And that's amazing. We were able to ship this in a modern, easy to use framework that everyone can just plug this in. We should find more ways of doing that. So let's uh, apply some of this logic to LiveView. LiveView is amazing, right? It lets you prototype very, very quickly, get up and running. It takes care of a huge part of the, this stack, right? From the data store all the way up into the client. And it looks something like this. So we have uh, our you know, Firefox process. It has a little bit of storage, uh, some state locally. It's going to communicate uh, over WebSockets, maybe even over an unreliable connection, which is already a huge lift. That's already amazing. And uh, here is a second process so that I can talk to you know, another user. And there's this fundamental split between those two. You have to go up into the server, across, and then back down. This means that the device and the data are kept fully separate. Right now, the server is handling more and more of things. And we've really taken it like really far, like right into the client device and sending uh, requests from that client device into the server. We've done this before. Uh, in the early 90s, Fujitsu had a, a game called Habitat, where you would click, uh, and it would send the XY uh, coordinates of that to uh, a copy of the game that was running on their servers. It would update the state and send you uh, the state back. So that's the same picture there. How far can we push this the other way? Well, not very far, because we always have to get data from this database. Right? So in order for us to push this the other way around, we have to break down this barrier completely. The world can look like this by using the same techniques that we use in Phoenix Presence, where we talk directly over, say, WebRTC and Bluetooth between devices, um, and over HTTP and WebSockets to a server. And there's nothing wrong with the server in this picture. You can absolutely have a server in this picture. You probably want your data to be available when your device is offline. right? But if we can make it so that peer-to-peer -peer is the new client server, this radically simplifies that image. This makes it much easier. This makes uh, um, uh, interaction on device instant, zero latency. Synchronization, potentially with the person next to you in the room. In order to do this, I've made a couple of references to this already, that we can see data as being in a global data space so not the physical layer of where it's actually laid out, just like we were looking at distributed systems, you know, we were worried about mutexes, right? We have these abstract files and directories, and different users who can look into it and get a different slice, a different subjective view of all of the data that's available. When you have data that's always available, different people will interpret it differently for different applications. This is some uh, exciting work from Ink and Switch about a project called Cambria, where uh, we need to translate between different schemas um, of data. The advantage for this, other than writing you know, translation between my thing and your thing and somebody else's, you know, and, and this n-way version, is that if I write a translation between A and B, and somebody else has written a translation between B and C, then now, transitively, like Quinn was mentioning this morning, uh, transitively, we can get from A to C. And even more than that, if there's now another B to D or B to Z, 
we can go through any of these uh, nodes in the network and follow these different paths and get from one application to another and back, or between different versions of an application, and right into older versions or into newer versions. Finally, when we understand the data at this layer, we can start really leaning into its properties. We can say, well, maybe it's set-like or map-like. There's not that many different models for data. We can add time travel to literally every application automatically without having to do anything special. We can make debugging dead simple and even replay the things in the debugger directly and try different paths through uh, time and making different choices without having to coordinate with anybody else, without polluting their data, and only synchronizing when we need to. So building better together. Again, this isn't avoiding success at all costs. We still need the Beam. The Beam is fabulous at what it does. It does networking. It does asynchrony. It does all these things that we need to enable this next generation, this new layer. We need um, new abstractions, new libraries built on top of it. There's nothing stopping us from doing this today. We can start going and building libraries and trying things out and seeing different ways of working. Eventually, yes, some of these, these ideas will probably end up in virtual machines like the Beam. But we don't have to wait around for that. We can build macros. We can build libraries. We also need an answer for WebAssembly. So I've uh, heard in a few talks and uh, spoken to a few people who are saying, well, it would be really nice if somebody built an integration for this for, uh, for Erlang. If we had a WebAssembly component, we could just plug it in. At minimum, we should have a, a really good first-class story for interacting with a Beam-like WebAssembly, something like Lumen. Lumen is a fantastic forward-looking project that needs resources. It needs cash. It needs contributors. Uh, please get involved. I would love to see this exist. Further reading, because it's not just me uh, on stage talking about this stuff. Um, if you're interested in this stuff, the, these are fabulous people to uh, read their blog posts, their papers, get in touch with. Peter Alvaro is criminally underread, I think. He has made uh, unbelievable, uh, has unbelievable ideas and advances and prototypes for these things. Uh, Christopher Micklejohn, literally out of this community, we should be taking his programming language LASP very seriously, and we should look at Partisan, uh, his uh, uh, distributed Erlang. Uh, Lindsay Cooper has uh, a version of variables that are coordination free. Right? So literally everybody on this list is doing incredible work. We're uniquely qualified because this community is so focused on distributed systems, on trying new things like CRDTs in Phoenix Presence. Right? For us to push some of these ideas forward, we need to do a couple things. We need to embrace the subject subjective nature of reality, the subjective nature of causality and physics. Now that we have all of this disk distributed around the world, we need to embrace that massive availability to have massive reliability. Remember that values are redundant and cache friendly. Should openly interoperate with everyone from the ground up in a way that won't break our systems. And we should find a WASM solution. Thank you. And come get some stickers. Wow, what an amazing ride you've given us. And I think you've given us challenges for the next, I don't know, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? <laughs> Hopefully. But we're up to it, right? We're up to it. Are we up to it? Yeah. <laughs> I can't hear you. Are we up to it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the reaction here is just because our heads are still spinning a bit. <laughs> and, and it's the end of the conference. But, you know, questions, please. We have the mic. And while people's heads are spinning a bit slower, maybe I can share a reflection. Mm. I really love the way you visualize things. Mm. It's amazing to, to visualize abstract, uh, rather complex com concepts, and that's an art in itself. 
And I think that's also an, a bigger pattern that we as a community, you mm. inspire us mm. to use visualizations to, to share challenges and problems in a very, very good way. So thank you for that as well. Yeah, we have questions. Come here, front, to the mic. Michael, to the mic. Hello, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, apart from Lumen, mm -hmm. what do you view as urgent, you painted a big vision. Mm -hmm. What do you view as urgent or, or maybe even obvious steps toward that vision that are currently not being worked on apart from Lumen? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, having uh, first class coordination free data structures uh, be ergonomic and immediately available. So th these are things like, but not, lim not limited to CRDTs, so that we can write into memory and coordinate, uh, well, it's coordination free, but uh, automatically merge data together so that we can have very, very fast uh, uh, location independent systems uh, so that we can communicate between directly between individual devices without there being a, a single source of truth, I think would be a really great start. That would solve a huge, huge class of problems. Thank you. More questions? Someone out there in the world? Well, we have someone at the back waving. Stretch. Oh, you were stretching. Okay. Making your head spins less, perhaps. Somewhere in the world, maybe someone has a question. Maybe you can unmute and ask the question. Sometimes you just need to wait, right? Yeah. <laughs> or in the room. Or not. But I guess there's still some time when our heads are spinning slightly less mm -hmm. during the, the sort of cooling down of the conference. I mean, you will be here, Brooklyn, right? Yep. So, so, and we have the contact details. So thank you again for mm -hmm. a fabulous, inspirational challenge to the whole community. Thank you.